Southern Wyoming by Patty Weber from the Wyoming State Geological Survey. And then, okay, here's one of these, you gotta pay attention. Um, the, the next talk will be Thursday, August 19th because Tuesday is voting day here. So instead of Tuesday, it's gonna be on Thursday, August 19th. And mm -hmm. that talk will be again, live and via Zoom. And it's by Dr. Ryan Thigpen, a really good friend of mine and a phenomenal speaker. And he's gonna be talking about a lot of new data he and his team of, of uh, students have been collecting that um, provides evidence that the Northern Paleo Teton range was re erased basically by the Yellowstone hotspot track. So um, please join us for that. Now I'd like to move on and introduce our speaker for tonight, JP Cavagelli. Uh, JP was born, as he says, back East in the summertime <laughs> of Swiss immigrant parents from the type Jurassic area in Switzerland. Uh, his, he is prep lab manager, field trip organizer and collections manager at the Tate Geological Museum at Casper College. As a biology major at the University of Chicago, JP became interested in paleontology, although way too late to get a degree in it. This led him to a summer spent in Wyoming, mostly in the Bighorn Basin, in 1983, doing field work in, in search of small Cretaceous mammal teeth with the University of Wyoming team. JP fell in love with Wyoming, as we all do, but left after a five-year adventure in fun and poverty as a ski bum and whitewater rafting guide in Colorado and Australia. JP came back to Wyoming in 1990 to be part of a paleontology field crew at the, at the University of, of Wyoming again. He stayed in Laramie working off and on in paleontology for 14 years, doing field geology and geophysics. He's also a fossil outfitter running Western paleo safaris for six years. So for the past 25 years, JP has been doing freelance fossil prep in his personal prep lab. He's had the good fortune of having been invited to join international paleontological expeditions in Niger, Mongolia, Tanzania, Alaska, and North Dakota. In his 10 years at the Tate Museum, he has led collecting trips all over the state to collect small and large fossils from D the mammoth and Lee Rex to microscopic mammal teeth and really old insects and ichthyosaurs. When he is not involved with fossils, JP enjoys bird watching, <laughs> traveling and playing hockey and hanging out with his wife. And I will add their dog. Um, and before I turn the mic over to JP, I'd like to uh, remind everybody on Zoom that if you would like to ask a question, please do so via chat and send your chat questions to Mike Adler, who is our Zoom host for tonight. All right, so chat, chat Zoom questions to Mike Adler. All right, thanks very much. JP, over to you. All right. Well, first of all, oh, does that work? Yeah, it's on. All right. I'm just going to speak loudly so you guys can hear me. First of all, thanks. Thanks for uh, having me come up to Jackson to speak to the geologists of Jackson Hole and uh, letting my wife and dog come up as well. It's very kind of you all. And a couple of corrections that I'm going to make on my, that, that uh, bio. It's a, apparently an old one I wrote and didn't edit it very well. I've been at the Tate Museum now for 17 years, not just 10. <laughs> and I have also since retired from hockey, I'm sorry to say. But uh, uh, here and tonight, I'm going to speak to you guys about the Green River Formation. And as the, the bio said, I am trained as a biologist, not a geologist. So if you have any real technical geology questions, I might just say, I don't know. But let's try it anyway. So the Green River Formation, it's a uh, world famous to us paleontologists, world famous Eocene deposit found mostly in southwestern Wyoming uh, and the border of Colorado and Utah. And let's see what the next slide tells us. I got to find the right buttons here. First thing I'm going to do, though, is tell you a little bit about where I work at the Tate Museum. Oh, I think I was getting. Let me see if I can figure this out. Page down. 
it was working earlier. All right, let me let uh, have a go at this. Interrupt. Um, and this is the part where you do a little song and dance. <laughs> well, you go over there and do a dance, and I'll try and figure this out. But then people on Zoom can't see me, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, done. Uh, let's try this again. We, we love that logo for the tape museum. Uh-huh. That's our, our resident artist, Russell Holly, drew that. I think when he was still just a volunteer 20 years ago. And it's been the logo ever since. <laughs> we do, but I didn't bring any with me. You know what? Next time, yes, I'll sell them for a dollar a piece. I think that's what they go for in the gift shop. <laughs> All right. I might just send you one. <laughs> I think we're good. Sorry right. about that, folks. So um, uh, first, a shameless plug for the Tate Museum, since I am in Jackson and it is a little bit of ways from, uh, from Casper. The Tate Museum started in about 1980 with a gift from Marion and Inez Tate. Marion was a oil geologist and made lots of money. They had one child who was institutionalized in Oregon. So they had a lot of money to give away. Uh, they had paid his bills throughout his life, and uh, they actually have a, a, a benevolent foundation in Casper that supports a lot of stuff in Casper, and they also support the museum. We are part of Casper College. We got, officially got an advisory board in the late 90s and a full-time director in 2002. We have a staff of three right now and one part-timer who is the gift shop manager. We have about 10 volunteers who do mostly fossil prep work and a few who dabble in tours in the museum. And the, the good thing about it is that the museum is always free uh, because Mrs. Tate wanted it that way. Uh, I heard a great story once. I don't know if this is true or if this is stolen from a movie about Miss Daisy, but Mrs. Tate after Marion died would hang out at the, not the Buckhorn, that's Laramie, the Wonder Bar in Casper and just kind of listen to what the oil guys were talking about. And she would bet her money based on what those guys were saying and made more money with the money she had. I don't know if it's true, but it's a great story. And she ended up sharing the money with the, with the city and lots of other folks. So here's the picture of the museum back in the early 80s. Oh, the picture of me in the corner is covering up the other one with the big red X. That's the Tate Modern in England. Well, let's just ignore that one. Uh, this is Mrs. Tate with the first uh, museum director who was also a geology professor and a geography professor. So museum directing was something that they foisted upon him. He already had a full-time job, that's Jerry Nelson. Uh, he is now no longer a long-haired hippie, but he's still around and is a retired professor. Uh, this is kind of pictures, uh, a quick uh, summary of what we do. I'm not gonna go through each of the ones, but the, the ones I'm mostly uh, involved with are the, near the bottom of the list. Oh, I don't know where that went. Bottom of the list, um, fossil collecting, expanding collections and paleontological field trips. Uh, so here's an example of a field trip. This is us collecting dinosaur bones out in Eastern Wyoming in the late Cretaceous. Uh, we do fossil preparation. I'm in charge of the prep lab. The picture on the left is old. That's about 16 years ago, working on a mammoth that we collected. I don't do much lab work anymore. I've moved my way up to administration. Woohoo! Uh, the specimen on the right is a very large freshwater turtle that one of my volunteers is working on. I also spend a lot of time with the collections and actually keeping the specimens in line and giving them all numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have a lot of volunteers, as I mentioned. Here's a couple of them working on various projects. Uh, and we identify bones and rocks for people. This is one we get a lot of. And uh, the customer is in blue, I'm in red. I'll just let you read that through that. And as soon as everyone gets a little chuckle, I think you have read it. Uh, every first weekend in June, we host a annual Tate conference. We've been doing this since 1994 with a couple of hiatuses, hiati, I don't know if that's the actual word. Uh, for COVID and for a few other uh, non-flowing events. So this year's conference was canceled and we're gonna do the Triassic Trials next June. 
We do two days of field trips and a day of talks. We bring in speakers from all over the country. And actually we did the last one in Zoom. So for the first time we had speakers in Europe, which was kind of cool. Those guys stayed up late to speak to us or was it early? I think it's late. Anyway, uh, I thought I took this slide out. I don't want to brag too much, but I got to do a TV show a couple of years ago. If you uh, watch PBS, we were on PBS uh, doing a prehistoric road trip show. This, this is a great picture because this is a field shot on the first day of summer in Medicine Bow. Notice the outfits. Patty, my boss at the time, and Becky, my wife over here is from the South, both had two layers of hats on because it was June 21st and the high was 45 degrees. And of course, Medicine Bow, the wind was blowing. So this is a picture of the, modern, of the museum as it sits right now. Uh, Back to the topic, the Green River Formation, a paleontological overview. Um, the Green River Formation is, this is a geology map of Wyoming. The Green River Formation is as big, if you can see my arrow, which I think y'all can. That's the one of the Green River deposits right there. There's another one down here. This is Rock Springs uplift here. So we're looking east and west of Rock Springs and Kemmerer is right in here. So this little strip of off brown color is also Green River. And then it extends down into, as you can see here, a little bit into Utah and on the Colorado Utah border. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in just a second. This is what Wyoming looked like about 50 million years ago. There was a huge lake down in that, what is now the Green River, excuse me, Green River Formation. And then another skinny little lake over here in the Thrust Belt. Uh, then there's a couple other scattered lakes. And this is a uh, reconstruction from. Let's try and move that up there, maybe. From a paper by Lilligraven and Ostretch in 88, where they uh, basically described where the water was flowing in and out of Wyoming 50 million years ago. Uh, so here's a uh, picture of where the Green River deposits are right now. We'll see this one quite a bit. There were actually three lakes back then. The top stuff here on the map, this is uh, Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, and a little bit of Idaho, but who cares about Idaho? Oh, I hope nobody from Idaho is watching. Anyway, Lake Goshute is up here, in, mostly in Wyoming. Lake Uinta is down here on the Colorado-Wyoming line. And Fossil Lake is over here next to Kemmerer. And you can see on the right-hand side that this is, these are time maps going across the bottom. And then I, I guess I'm in the way there. There. You can see the lakes getting bigger and then eventually shrinking at the late Middle Eocene. Uh, this is just a fun map done by Ray Troll for his book, uh, what was it called? Cruising the Fossil Freeway. Thanks, Mike. Uh, if you're not familiar with this book and you want to learn something about paleontology, I recommend it. But uh, Ray Troll, the artist, did a wonderful map of the Western US, including the fossils in here from the Green River Formation and down here as well. So here's a little bit of stratigraphy. Um, you can see that the fossil basin, so this is the fossil lake deposits over here, short-lived lake, not very uh, geographically uh, widespread. Lake Goshute here in the middle, longer lived, a little bit more widespread. And then uh, the Lake Uinta, which is the one down in Colorado, Utah, lasted a whole lot longer and it got quite a bit larger east-west wise. Uh, Age-wise, Eocene, we're looking at about 55 million to 37 million years ago for the Uinta deposits, and uh, quite a bit less for the two that are centered in Wyoming. But that doesn't mean ours is any lesser. Uh, on the right-hand side, the, the uh, Green River Formation is separated into different members. I have a few, uh, few of the most fossiliferous members outlined in blue. These won't be on the test, so don't worry too much about it. But let's see, history of discovery. I'm not gonna expect you to read all this, but it was first found, the uh, Green River fossils in the Green River Formation were first found very early in East, uh, Western expansion. Uh, the first fishes were found in the Green River beds in 1856. And uh, just to have a little perspective, the town of Green River hadn't existed yet in 1868. So what's that, 12 years later, the tracks connecting the East and West or the tracks, the railroad tracks made it to the now town of Green River. In 1869 was when John Wesley Powell set off from the town of Green River, south of here to explore the, what is now known as the Grand Canyon. Uh, 
1869, same year John Wesley Powell set off, uh, Hayden, who's got a valley named for him up in Yellowstone, uh, named the Green River Formation. And in 1871, the petrified fish cut was discovered. Whoops, let's go backwards. I don't know why it does that. Uh, this bottom right picture, I'm gonna get myself out of the way there, is a stereo photo of the fossil fish cut that was actually done back in the 1870s. And if you can see stereo pictures without a stereogram, I'll give you a minute to look at that and cross your eyes and get all dizzy and see it coming out at you. I haven't seen this actual site, but I'd love to go find it someday. It's on my list of things to do, but meanwhile, I have a real job I have to go to. Page two of fossil discoveries. Edward Drinker Cope, seen on the right here, uh, collected a lot. He actually came out from back east. Uh, he was involved in the dinosaur wars between Cope and Marsh, but that's a whole nother project. Uh, a fellow named Robert Lee Craig started commercially digging these things before, the nine, before 1900. Near, uh, near the town of Fossil, which, oh, I should have put this in a slide. I have a great, pic, a great couple of maps, one geology topo maps from the eight, 1940s, where there actually is a town of Fossil. And then the latest topo map of Kemmerer shows the town of Fossil doesn't exist anymore, which is what you were driving in that area. There is no town of Fossil anymore. And right now there are about 20 commercial quarries digging fishes in the Green River Formation. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, years ago before I came, became a paleontologist, uh, it was mentioned in my bio that my family is from Switzerland and I went to visit one of my family at one point and my uncle who has lived in Switzerland all his life and never left the country had a Green River fish on his mantelpiece. And wow. these things are sold all over the world in gift shops by the millions. They, they are world famous and they are world famous to paleontologists and they're also beautiful. So they get sold to non-paleontologists as cute, cool little trinkets. Uh, so let's see, I don't know what I was gonna say about that slide, but there's what we saw earlier. I'm gonna basically talk about the three separate lakes uh, cause that's the way I see this all. So let's start with Fossil Lake going back. Let's go back. So Fossil Lake, again, this small skinny lake over here, we're gonna start over there. So this is the smallest and shortest lived lake. It's also the deepest and it's mostly a founder, the deposits are found around Kemmerer. There are possibly salt water, but only temporarily. An excellent fossil fish record that include Fossil Butte National Monument and the commercial quarries and they are limey shales. They're on some geology, actual geology in there. Here's a couple examples of some of the fishes that you find in there. Uh, something I wanna keep in mind, I'm gonna show you a lot of fossils. Uh, keep in mind that most of these fossils are not found as you will see them. They are found like as you see them and then picked at with picks under microscopes for a long time before they end up looking really cool. Well, that was a, this is Fossil Butte and the, the big scenery picture at the bottom, that's Fossil Butte itself. Uh, Fossil Lake, uh, here's just a couple more species of fish. The, the one in the bottom center is Nydia and if you guys are familiar with state fossil of Wyoming, that's it right there. Wyoming is actually one of the few states that has a state fossil and a state dinosaur. Our state dinosaur is Triceratops, but again, that's a different top, different talk. Uh, fossil Lake also has some non-fish found and in including the earliest known bats up in the top center. There's a lot of turtles and crocodiles. When I say a lot, I should specify that there's a lot uh, is a strong word, but we'll get to that in a sec. Fossil Lake also has lots of bird fossils. Here's a couple of uh, specimens. These look like, pretty much look like birds, but a lot of the fossil birds don't actually look like birds to the untrained geologist, let's say, who doesn't have a zoological background. Uh, let's see, here's a couple other examples. Um, any bird watchers in the crowd? I got two, all right. Two and a half, three and a half. Uh, swifts and hummingbirds are often put together in the order, God, I can't remember the name of the order, but they're often classified together. And if you look at a swift and you look at a hummingbird, they don't look anything alike. But this fossil that you see a positive and negative of on the top half, Eocipcellus, I think I pronounced that okay, is a split fossil uh, that is actually a, 
the intermediary, inter intermediary between swifts and hummingbirds. This other one in the bar on the right is a relative of turacos, which if you know turacos, they are tropical, brightly colored fruit eating birds. Uh, <clears throat> again, the, this uh, little fella on the left, he looks like he's running, but again, we pull out, pull out your anatomy, uh, anatomy genes, if you will, anatomy lessons. That front foot of his running is actually his wing bones. So he's not actually running. He wasn't caught in the act of running away. And he's a, a roller-like bird. Again, if you're not a bird watcher, a roller is not something you're gonna know about if you live in North America. And same with the other thing on the other side, the coli or mouse bird. Again, the, the theme here that I'm getting at is birds that are, birds found 50 million years ago here in Wyoming are related to birds not found anywhere near Wyoming at this point in time. Uh, Trefica on the left an Eocene oil bird. Raise your hand if you know what an oil bird is. That's a, a stumper. An oil bird is actually the only bird known to hibernate. They are found in Colombia and Venezuela. They are related to nighthawks and whippoorwills, and they are 100% frugifer frugivorous. They eat fruit, primarily the fruit of palm trees. And one of the cool things about the deposit fossil lake, you get this oil bird thing, and you also get palm leaves. So these things are probably eating palm nuts or palm fruit 50 million years ago. Uh, on the right hand side, a much bigger bird. This thing is probably uh, five feet across. It's a relative of frigate birds. Frigate birds are large. Are you gonna make that stop? Um, I am. Okay, I'm gonna let you, if you know Sorry, how. Sorry guys, I'm just- Interruption. A, a time out here in the library. Um, Say hi to somebody. Yeah, that's what I want to hi. Um, loading meeting address. Hey. All right. So frigate birds. So far, all the birds I've shown you are uh, examples of tropical forest birds. Frigate birds are tropical seabirds. They are huge. They steal food from gulls and terns nowadays. They are, uh, if you make it down to Key West or anywhere in Mexico on the coast, you'll see these things. There's a freshwater example here 50 million years ago, and it's almost as big as the modern ones. Uh oh, our page down thing doesn't work anymore. Oh man, she ran away. Escape? Okay, I'm just gonna go with that. Uh -uh. <laughs> uh, any questions so far from the audience here in town? That's, a, that's an excellent question. I'm glad you asked. The question was, do we have these fossils at the Tate Museum? And the answer is no. <laughs> we, I have the very last slide, I think, is two of the birds that we have at the, at the Tate Museum. These fossils are mostly at the Field Museum in Chicago. And the Field Museum has, uh, wait, let me get my book. A feller named Lance Grandy is stationed at the Field Museum and he has been studying the fossil fish deposits, I wanna say for 40 years. So he goes out every summer for weeks at a time and collects, collects in amongst the commercial quarries and he has gotten access to all the really good stuff. It stopped moving on the page down. I wanna put a plug in for the library. We have this book here in the library. This, because I asked them to buy it. And it's a really good book. And not only well, because it's got, it it's, <laughs> it's got great pictures and it tells you all about the Green River Formation and other fun stuff. It stopped going downhill. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, folks, we've got another little technical glitch here. Um, it, get, it, you can good. feel free to get some popcorn or whatever you'd like to do. Bathroom break. Don't all flush at the same time, like it's Super Bowl. It just, it just went down. It went, it went, it went to it's gotta be that thing. Okay. <laughs> well, while we're here, let yeah. me do one thing real quick. Uh, well, just for the record, this is JP. This is not Cynthia Blankenship. I'm Cynthia Blankenship. It's my computer. <laughs> and I don't really wanna take the time to mess with this. So back right. to you, JP. Try that again. Page down. Okay, we got that work. Thank I'm gonna you. leave the book up here for you folks in, in the room to look at afterwards, because it is pretty cool. 
Um, other fossils from Fossil Lake include insects and a couple of species of shrimp. Um, the insects are amongst, well, I, I'll, I'll backtrack on that. The insects are rare, but they are amongst the best preserved in the world. Uh, speaking of rare, over the decades that folks have been collecting over there, there has been three snakes found. These are two of them. The one pictured in black and white is, has been missing for about 40 years. The one pictured in color was found within the past 10 years. And there's a third one that has, was found recently that is, has not been prepared yet. And again, with the millions of fish that they have found and collected over there, this is the only frog ever seen. So that's kind of cool, very rare. Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, it's about, uh, oh, I don't know, four feet high there. No, I don't know. It's, it's a small frog. Yeah. On the snakes. JP, when somebody asks a question, can you repeat oh, yeah. the question for the so, Zoom yes, audience, please? Thanks. thanks. Uh, the question was, what's the size scale on the, uh, the frog and the snake? And uh, offhand, I'm not sure. It's a small frog and the snakes, I read it just this morning. I think one of them is a meter long and the other one's just shy of a meter. And they are boids, which uh, are boa. And if you look at these carefully, I don't think you can see it on these pictures. One of the things boas still have is a vestigial femur, which not a lot of people know that. They still have a, a back leg. And in modern boas, it is, it's a spur. And on these little guys, if I knew where to look, I would be able to probably find them, but I'd have to read the scientific paper first. I haven't done that in a while. Let's go see what else we got. Fossil lake deposits have tons of different reptiles, including crocodiles, lizards, and turtles. And amongst the rarest of the rare are the fossil mammals. Uh, here's a, a couple examples. And I noticed that you guys had a picture of the same horse in the promo. This horse was collected a few years ago. And because these things are all commercially collected, they end up on the, fossil, on the, uh, on the open market. And I know they were asking 2 million for the horse. I don't think they got that. They got one. They, I think it did sell for about 1 million bucks. To the AMNH in New York City. Is it really? Well, see, I come to these things to learn something too. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Paleocynopa, the little, uh, little non-horse thing on the left. That's the, there's uh, three really good, known, really good skeletons from the, the Fossil Lake. And one of the cool things about the... Uh, fossil lake deposits is things like paleosinopa are known in the, the deposits above and below and besides fossil lakes so same time period and the early and later time periods but they're only known mostly from jaws and and uh, teeth so when you get something like this you get a much better impression of what the animal might have done in real life and this thing is supposedly an, an otter like a semi-marine critter that was going to eat was uh, eating as opposed to the otter, otter is purely carnivorous. This thing was less carnivorous, probably ate fruits based on its teeth. Uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, Fossil Lake is also known for the oldest bats in the world. The one on the left was discovered, I believe in the thirties and was for a long time, the only complete fossil bat from Fossil Lake. And in the past 20 years, they've collected 12 or 13 or 14 more specimens, including a second species the Onychornicturus finii, named after one of the commercial collectors, uh, Bonnie Finney, who found it and died of cancer about 10 years ago, but it's named after her. And if you look at these two pictures, the main difference, the obvious difference, if you look at the wingtips on the finii, there's a little claw at the end of each little finger, which is not present in the other bat, and it's not present in any modern bat either. So this colorful bat on the right, is a more primitive bat, and the more uh, more advanced bat on the left is more is more advanced and more closely related to modern bats. And these are the oldest fully bat specimens. There are some older possible teeth that might be bats. One of the interesting things about bats is that as soon as they show up in the fossil record, they are bats, no doubt about it. And, uh, you know, about 25 years ago, whales had the same problem. Fossil whales, as soon as they showed up in the fossil record, they were whales. And some folks in the past 20, 30 years have been collecting in especially Pakistan and some of the other Stan countries and have been able to uh, find older, older whales and older and older whales that eventually you get so old that they are land animals. 
and they've got a really good history of bats or excuse me whales maybe someday we'll get the same knowledge about bats but for now these are the oldest known bats and they are bats there's also plants known this is actually lance grandi or half of lance grandi on the right hand side <laughs> for scale so this one has scale all my others are not scaled uh, one of the coolest things, I think, in fossil lake deposits is uh, the Presbyornis nesting sites. Presbyornis is a, well, it was originally described as a flamingo duck. It is now known to be, well, it's now considered to be more of a sandpiper flamingo. Uh, they have really good skeletons, but not particulated ones like I've just shown you. If you look at the map of the quarry on the left-hand side there, those are all individual bones just piled up on top of each other. And there's, I think, 15 sites within the fossil lake deposits where they have piles and piles and piles of these bones and some eggshells. So pretty good evidence that these things are uh, nesting sites. Uh, these are not in the fossil bed, the uh, fossil fish bed. So these are a little bit, uh, let's see, if we look at the stratigraphy here, you guys are all uh, geologists. The, uh, the fish beds are, if I can remember where, right here, lower sandwich horizon, right there in the middle unit. The nesting sites are at the top of the Green River and the bottom of the Green River at Warfield Creek, which is down around Kemmerer. So they're in different beds, but these are some of the more well-known fossils that are not coming out of the fish beds. Uh, Here's a quick review, since I'm a bird watcher and I've, did a, I've done a fossil birds of Wyoming uh, talk. This is a review of the known species plus the, the little box, the unyet, unyet known or not yet described. And the ones I've got in, uh, in bold, those are the, what the modern birds now are tropical. So you can see that there's quite, an, quite a uh, tropical influence here. Uh, the Tate Museum artist, Russell Hawley, drew this little uh, reconstruction here on the left, showing the tropical forest and a bunch of, bunch of random birds. I'm not gonna tell you which ones are which because that would take too long. Uh, Fossil Lake is also not, for the, the geo economic geologists in the crowd, is not where we get our trona. Trona is one of the uh, mineral resources mined out of the Green River Formation here in Wyoming. And I think for this, we're gonna go to Lake Goshoot which is on the map here on the right, this large one that is centered around Rock Springs and Green River and all the way out to Wamsutter and probably out all the way out to, uh, for those familiar with the map here, this is gonna be Little America roughly along I-80 and all the way up to Big Piney going north. Um, slightly different beds. It looks a lot like this at uh, a Flaming Gorge down on the Wyoming-Utah line. Notice the beautiful laminated beds, uh, continuous beds that go on forever. This area here, as far as I'm concerned, is ripe for exploration. It hasn't been explored much at all for fossils, but there are a few things known from there. Uh, oh, there, look, there's the Laney Shale member. I forgot that was in there. The, the, the arrow is point. The whole thing is Laney Shale, except for this peak over here. But that whole, all the fine bedded stuff is Laney Shale, and that does produce fossils, including there are some... Uh, mass mortality layers of a fish, fish called Goshudictes. And back in the old days, before the BLM decided it was illegal to collect vertebrate fossils on BLM land, they used to call these things farsen fish, because you got, no, not farsen, fontanelle. Because you, you have fontanelle fish, I think, farsen fish beds, because you got them around farsen and fontanelle, which are kind of just south of here, what, three hours maybe. There's also some uh, stromatolite beds out there and beautiful petrified woods. Petrified wood in uh, Eden Valley in the Blue Forest. Uh, Lake Goshute has some fish beds, but the fish there are completely different than the fish you find in Fossil Lake. And because they're not extensively collected, there are not so many extremely rare things, but these are the more common things. This little guy, Arismatopterus, on the upper right, is often found in big flocks. And there was actually, oh, maybe five years ago, a report from the paleontologists who had found a, a, a school of these things all flocking together and they were all preserved on a, on a slab, maybe a foot by a foot 
Erismentopterus is about an inch and a half to two inches long. So they had found a school of them on a slab about a foot square, and they were all bunched together, all facing the same direction. And they had published it as a, a petrified school of fish, whether it can be, uh, to me, whether they are petrified as a school or if it's just a bunch of fish who got washed in, faced in the same direction from currents, could still be argued, but I'm not gonna do that right here and now. I'll leave that for other people to argue. Uh, the other common fish is a Hypisodorus, a catfish. And any of you who are familiar with catfish, modern catfish have beautiful spines here along, there's another one here, just behind the head. These are catfish. And Amazon is uh, a relatively modern sucker. So again, very different uh, collection of fish. Uh, also, presbyornis bones are found in Lake Goshute. This is a sample from the University of Wyoming collection. Uh, those are, that's one out of, I think, four drawers of a, a storage cabinet that is just 100% bird bones from one quarry that was collected by Paul McGrew back in the, I wanna say, early 60s maybe. Uh, Lake Goshoot also has some more well-known uh, invertebrate fossils, uh, in particular, the uh, Turritella agate. This is stuff that, this is what it looks like in the wilds, top and center. This is a chunk of it from the wilds in the bottom left. And it is often used, often cut and polished by the geologists or rock hounds, which is what you see in the upper right. The bottom left picture is a picture of Delaney Rim, this layer right here that my arrow is going along. That's the layer that the fish come, the, the, uh, the snails come from. And they, it actually extends out into this dirt road. So this whole area is a good place to go find this stuff. And it is publicized in books and websites. And there is a ton of this stuff out there, but it's pretty cool. Uh, also some giant stromatolites. This one is from Colorado, barely across the border. There's a Jacob staff in the middle there. That's two meters high. And that is that big ball is a stromatolite. So a fossilized algae going back 50 million years. There's also last year, a, uh, a local fella from actually from Colorado was out collecting fossil wood in the Eden forest and found this thing here. It's actually a crocodile snout. The rest of the skull is going into the hill. And we at the Tate Museum are gonna go collect this thing this summer. We got a BLM permit to go collect it. So I'm kind of looking forward to that. And here's the one bird that I know of from the Lake Goshute. Again, if you can do stereo pictures, this was found by folks doing a uh, survey for a pipeline. This is the, the curvy thing up on top is the bird's wishbone. The other bones are going from behind the wishbone, the humerus, radius ulna here, and the finger bones down here. This is, as far as I know, besides the presbyornis bones, this is the only bird fossil known from Lake Goshute. It's now in the University of Colorado collections, waiting to be described. Lake Goshute is indeed the source of Wyoming's Chona, which is why there are all these huge Chona mines around the town of Green River. Chona is an evaporite that was developed, uh, deposited way back in the Eocene. Uh, evaporative, let's see, where was I going with that? Yeah, evaporites are an excellent source of salts, including in this case, uh, you guys know what Trona is. You're all geologists, right? Hydrated sodium carbonate. And I know one of the main things they do with it is make uh, sodium bicarbonate. And they, make, they put it in glass, they put it in toothpaste, they put it all over the place. It's a, a big product for Wyoming. Uh, going back to the map of the three lakes, we're gonna now go, now go down to Lake Uinta in Colorado and Utah. There's a really ugly map. These are the maps you can steal off the internet of the geology of Utah and Colorado. Not nearly as nice as the Wyoming map that I also stole off the internet. But uh, this yellow bit in Utah, that's the Green River Formation, extends into Colorado a little bit with that little orange blip. And this is an aerial view of the Lake Uinta deposits in uh, Northeastern Utah. This is uh, the White River. This is up by the town of Bonanza. This area is well known for fossil insects and leaves. And this is all public BLM land. And on BLM land, it's okay to collect invertebrates and leaves. So this string of white holes you see going diagonal through the bottom left picture, 
all those little holes, well, from here they're white patches, but all those holes are little quarries made by amateur and professional fossil hunters. The museum, uh, the Denver Museum has been collecting out there for decades and have an excellent collection of insects from this place. Uh, there's an example of one of the quarries and the insect here, I mentioned that the insects from Fossil Lake are pretty well preserved, but these things down there in Colorado and Utah are spectacular to the point of, I mean, this is a mosquito. It just, uh, most of the insects there, you can see individual hairs, you can see the, uh, the lenses in the eyes, you can see the veins in the wings. It's one of the best fossil insect spots in the world. Uh, commercial but geology, they uh, collected, you, know, you have mined gilsonite down there. Uh, there's gilsonite is an oil product. I'm not sure exactly what it's used for, but look at that last, the last the paragraph there, last bullet point. It's used in lots of stuff. But the, the, what I found was the coolest thing that they used it for was for painting Model Ts back in, uh, as long as you liked it black, as long as you can have it in any color, as long as you liked it black. <laughs> and that's where they got the, uh, the black paint for that. And uh, there was actually a uh, fairly destructive Gilson, Gilsonite mine explosion in 1953, killed about eight workers. And let's see, I'm not sure, oh, this is my map of, let's skip that. This is a map of Kemmerer anyway. And these two white spots are commercial fish quarries. And that's zoom, Google Earth again, zooming in on them. And one of the reasons that we have all these excellent, excellent fossils, the birds and, and the mammals that I showed you is because these things are commercially collected. Uh, if I go back one, you can kind of get a, a, an idea of the scale of these quarries here. This is the road, the two track you drive down to get in here. Notice all the vehicles in here. The, the uh, head wall of the quarry is right in here. So basically the whole area that with all these vehicles, and it's the size of a Walmart parking lot has been mined and collected for the past 20 or 30 years. Same thing for this uh, little quarry up on top of the picture. There's a lot of digging goes on out there every summer. And you can see little uh, vehicles out here in the, in the uh, sagebrush. A lot of the folks who collect commercially out there or even hobby collectors go out and camp out in their camper for a week or 10 weeks at a time collecting these fish. And when you collect so many fish, you're bound to find the good stuff. There's that picture of that horse again. And there are two different layers that they collect. The ones I just showed you pictures of are what they call the split fish layer. Uh, where basically most of the time, oops, this is, most of the time the fish, you, what you do is you take a, a plate of the rock and it comes, it comes in flat plates because it's nice even limestone that's deposited in the bottom of these lakes. You turn it up vertically, you put a chisel in between the rocks, between the rock layers, and you hit it with a hammer until it splits. And in the split fish layer, oftentimes the fish will come out as a positive and a negative on one side and the other. The other layer that they collect a lot is called the 18 inch layer. And it is not so easily collected. It's a much harder layer. And the fish, when you find them, are what you get is the impression or you can see the impression of the vertebrae and then you have to go and prep them with sandblasting materials and it's a lot more work. People argue that you get a much nicer fish when you get the black fishes uh, as opposed to the brown fish on yellow rock, but that's a matter of opinion. Uh, and I think this last bit is kind of repetitive. The one thing uh, I was gonna mention is that the the Eocene fossil bird record from the Green River Formation is, is definitely the best fossil bird record anywhere in North America, other than the Pleistocene. Uh, and it is number two in the world behind a place called Messel in Germany. And Messel is a, uh, was an oil shale quarry. This is it right here in the background. It's just a, a, compared to as much, the big holes that we've made collecting fish, Messel is a pretty small hole. It's incredibly rich. And if you look at these specimens on the right, it, uh, like the, uh, the Green River Formation, it often preserves feathers like you see in this big specimen in the middle. And look at this bottom right specimen. You can even see the tail feather patterns and the wing patterns in that guy, the color patterns. Uh, the Messel pit, was commercially, well, not commercially, it was actually, it was commercially collected until Germany said, nope, you can't do that, that's too special. 
But the commercial collectors back in the 70s actually found a way to preserve these things because basically they were collecting oil shales that were paper thin. And when they collected them, they had to keep them wet or the things disintegrate or they, they would dry out and exfoliate and the fossil would be gone. But the guys collecting this stuff actually found a, a useful way to collect them. And what they do is they, I think they embed them in plastic and then they put the whole thing in resin and they prep it, they prep the rock off the resin. So most of these fossils you see here, even the feathers, the feathers and the bones are stuck in the resin as the last layer of, of, of a really thin paper shales. Uh, at this point, it's only collected by the museum in, in uh, Frankfurt. And the, they have the best collection of Eocene birds. But the cool thing is the birds from Messel in Germany are almost exactly the same as the birds we get here. So the, and, uh, and that's, that's true for mammals at the same age too. So there's definitely a connection between Europe and North America uh, biologically. And after this, I'm not sure where, uh, I'm just gonna go uh, zoom through uh, a bunch of undescribed bird specimens. I've put a name like, uh, on a, this slideshow is several years old since I've done it. Some of them have actually been part of papers. But I'm just gonna zoom through a bunch of undescribed specimens and you'll see some of them are pretty scrappy like this one on the bottom. You see a couple of wing bones up there but beautiful feather preservation. And this one up on top, well, yeah, there's a few bones in there. Whether it'll ever get described with just ribs and a couple legs, I don't know. Uh, more birds, bird fossils. And as a bird watcher and a fossil guy, I do like these birds. And this is one of the few that we have at the Tate Museum. Uh, a wing, uh, humerus, radius ulna, and then finger bones down here. And we are pretty sure that this black mat is decomposed flesh and feathers. But if you look right down in here, the bottom of that picture, you can actually see the feather patterns. Why I'm focusing on the wrist bones up here, I can't remember, but I should be focusing on the feathers. There they are on the bottom. And that's what I have to say. And let's see, at this point, do we have any questions? I'll start with Mike. It was definitely hot. It was hot and tropical. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mike was asking what was the climate like back there, back then, 50 million years ago. And we have good evidence just from biology. And I think the evidence exists from geology as well that it was hot and tropical. We got palm leaves, we got all these tropical birds or relatives of modern tropical birds and crocodiles. Crocodiles. Modern crocodiles nowadays, if it gets too cold at all, they, they don't survive. So they don't make it past North Carolina coming up the coast on the East Coast. Uh, uh, I should say crocodiles, the group, crocodilians, so crocodiles and alligators. Um, turtles, turtles are less of an economic or a, a ecological uh, bellwether, but a lot of the stuff that we have from the Green River Formation tells us tropical. Yes, sir. Why is the, uh, the fossil version have so many I think that is because it is commercially collected. Okay, there, there probably is in Spain. There is, and there's one quarry I know of in Lake Goshute, just outside of the town of Green River, was collected illegally in the, I want to say the 80s. I should know this because I was part of the deal, and I'm not going to put this out for the public record, but I was, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say it. I was hired on as a hired hand to go collect this one quarry. And uh, turns out that we were collecting illegally and we were getting lots and lots of fish. So they're out there. It's just that no one's collected, no one's made a big enough hole and spent the time to find them. It's not because of the structure of the lake. I, I don't you think so. The the, uh... it, was, it was in the thrust belt, yeah. And, and that one was deeper, and there's, they actually noticed a difference of fish if you're in the deep part of the middle of the lake and if you're on the shallower edges. But in terms of, I, I don't think there's any difference that, I don't think that the deepness of the lake has anything to do with the, the difference. The Lake Goshute is very shallow, but I think 
if you start digging in it, you will find lots of fish and many different species. It's actually from that whole escapade, if you ever make it to uh, Western Wyoming College in Rock Springs, they have a nice little museum in the hallway full of fossils. And there's a beautiful little alligator, like about that long on a slab of rock. And the guy I was, the guy who had hired me for the weekend uh, eventually got busted because he told his colleagues at his, at his real job that he had found an alligator and was gonna make a million bucks off it from the Japanese. And one of the ladies in there says, so you don't have permission to collect this, but you're gonna make a million bucks? Hmm, and he got busted. And I don't know what happened to him, but I was, I was apparently, a, I was a witness in that case and, and they J are there. JP, we have some questions oh, from okay. chat. So if we could uh, we'll take go. those, Mike Adler, All right. can you read those? Uh, yes, I can, I'm, I'll unmute myself. Uh, there were three questions that are exactly the same. So I'll just quickly uh, go through them. Uh, you, they, people were interested in having you mention your book again, um, the title of it and maybe some of the specifics. Okay, the, uh, the title is The Lost World of Fossil Lake. It's by Lance Grandy. Will that work? That's way the out of world of Fossil Lake. I can write that down in the text. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll just add that to the text. And while I'm doing that. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So uh, not sure why Mike went on silent there, but. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was, I do have one more question if you want to uh, take it. This is more, a little more substantive. Uh, the question occurred earlier in your talk, which was, how can you tell uh, that a bird would hibernate 50 million years ago? You mentioned a, a hibernating bird. And so someone was asking That's how you could tell that, that this bird hibernated. Maybe, maybe I spoke too much. We don't know if that bird hibernated, but it's very similar to the modern oil bird that hibernates in Colombia, Venezuela. And it's also found with palm leaves, which the modern oil bird eats palm fruit. So whether it hibernated or not, we don't know. But it was quite similar to the modern oil bird. So if I, if I said that it hibernates, I must have misspoke, and I, that, that wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> okay. and, and that's all the questions I have uh, from this end. All right. Thanks, Mike. I think we got one more here in the corner. Uh, so the question was about the time scale between the times the lake started and then when they went so dry. So the, the one in Fossil Lake was, I think, six million years, maybe even less. Uh, the one in Utah and Colorado, Lake Uinta, was up to 17 million years. Let me see if I can. I'm going to go all the way back. We can figure that out. Somewhere in here, or not, I can't find it that easily, but it was 17 million I know for the, the bigger lake in Utah and Colorado, and 6 million or less for the two here in Wyoming. Another question here? They are primarily freshwater, but with possible salty intervals when just uh, probably when the drainage changed or something. And there are, th there are things like a, the stingray, which I showed, uh, which modern stingrays are primarily saltwater, but it's easy enough for them to become freshwater because we know there are freshwater sharks nowadays and even saltwater sharks will swim hundreds of miles up the Amazon, the Orinoco and the Nile and bigger rivers. There was a question about repeating that question, that last question. Oh, well, you didn't hear the question. Is that what you said, Mike? Yes. Oh, uh, she, uh, she asked if the, uh, if the lakes were primarily freshwater or saltwater or a combination thereof. So look, th that was, th that was my answer. <laughs> and I think we have one more question here. How, how the picture of these formations and it seems like the fossils are only found in very select horizons yeah so the the question is how thick are, are the formations 
A and B, the, quest, the fossils seem to be found only in specific horizons. Um, the fossils, the layers are fairly thick, uh, measured in, I would say, a thousand feet thick, in, in, or give or take a little bit, depending on which lake you're in and at what time period. Um, I think the fossils, it can be said, are found throughout, but some of them are rich enough to be mined commercially. So, I mean, you could walk around in the Green River Formation and probably find, dig a hole anywhere, but you'll find a fish. I just don't know how long it will take you if you're not in one of the rich layers. And actually the guys who do dig these, these big quarries approached the museum, the Tate Museum last year, or no, before, before COVID and said, hey, we found some stuff in our bulldoze material. So overburden, he found, he bulldozed through a crocodile and a rhino. And he wanted, so that they're up there, they're above there, but they are very uncommon. And he wanted to donate them for a large sum of money, but we didn't have that large sum of money. <laughs> for a large sum. Um, so just for everybody here, the library is making some announcements about closing at seven. So just ignore that. We can have, we can stay here till, till longer than that. All right. So yeah, they're, they are out there. And, uh, there are more. There are some layers that are rich, richer than others, and uh, the uh, the paleontologist at Fossil Butte National Monument, Arvid Ose, it's A A S E, pronounced Ose, has uh, developed a great talk and theory about why some of these layers are so rich. If you guys want to get him up to, to give another talk, I'd say give him a call. Yes, sir. Um, early in the presentation, you showed this horse and a turtle. I think you said. That they were going to be sold, the one is for like a million. Yeah. But I thought the deal the private quarries had with the state was that special discovery went to the state. So his question is do the commercial collectors have a special deal with the state when they're digging on state land? Yes, they do. That's more or less your question. But some but a lot of these quarries are not on state land. The ones where they're getting the the, the horse, for example, where they can sell it for a million bucks is indeed on private land. The deal on state land is that the guys can keep uh, six species. The rare stuff goes to the state. And that's how we got that, that one bird wing that I showed you at the end. That, was, that one came off a of state quarry. Anything else? Mike, any more questions uh, from Zoom chat? Uh, no more from this end. Well, it's, a, it's a fascinating business. I mean, the, the paleontology of this and the commercial collecting of it, a lot of, a lot of folks out there, paleontologists, professional paleontologists are very much against the fossil, commercial co fossil collecting. But I think uh, as a professional paleontologist, I think there's room for discussion amongst pro pro professionals and commercials. And I mean, the, the picture I'm showing is that without the commercial uh, collecting here, we would not have this beautiful picture of the birds, which are my favorite. And so I'm all in support of commercial collecting down in Cameroon. Sort of another book you just watched earlier, the one that said, the author of The question was about uh, a second book that you might have shown. Did in I show your... a book or just pictures from a book? Oh, yeah. It's a Cruising the Fossil oh, Freeway. Oh, Cruising like the Fossil Freeway? freeway? Is that the one I showed the painting with yes. the drawings? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, Kirk Johnson and Ray Troll. So Kirk Johnson is the, he's now the head of the Natural History Museum at the Smithsonian. And Ray Troll is a, uh, a natural history artist based out of Alaska. And the two of them did a show and tell tour of the Western paleontological goodies, if you will, with Kirk explaining the geology and Ray drawing uh, really interesting drawings based on what Kirk was saying. And actually for beginning geologists, it's really well done. Uh, I'd never showed the book. I just showed the picture from it. I don't know if I can find it again. Oh, oh I saw it flash by. That's the, it comes with a, uh, with a poster size map and this is from the map. And I don't know if I have it in here, but one of the things Kirk uh, Ray did is that in every state, he put a picture of a cheeseburger. <laughs> because, hey, you got to have cheeseburgers. 
and I don't see one in in Colorado or Wyoming. No, they're not. They're off my picture here, but they are there. And it's called Cruising the Fossil Freeway. Okay. And he recently did it. They they recently did another one called. So co cruising, you know, something about the fossil coastline where they went from Alaska down through British Columbia and to Washington, Oregon, California, and even into Baja, uh, talking to paleontologists and explaining and drawing. And I, I actually got a short paragraph in that one. I'm pretty proud of myself. <laughs> but, yeah, since we were talking about books again, why don't you mention that book one more time in case anyone didn't get it? Uh, the, okay. The first it's uh, no, your book. First I think it means your book. This one here? Yes. Your book, All right. Yes. So I'm going to do this in a Jeopardy uh, a Wheel of Fortune style where you have to pronounce and enunciate the lost world of Fossil Lake. Snapshots from Deep Time by Lance Grandy. I hope that was well enunciated. I think you got it. Thank you. And it's 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 really well in, illustrated, and it is a comprehensive uh, forty uh, summary of forty years of digging in the the fossil fish beds down around Kemmerer. And he doesn't include the other lakes or some of the other layers, but it is really well done and wonderfully illustrated. And on that note, great. Okay. Thank you, JP. Thank you very so much. much. And uh, we and really you appreciate you making the whole the trip here. Uh -huh. And so we have a little a gift for Sweet. you here. Thank you. So do I get to open it now? Yeah, open it now. Show the folks on Zoom. This is well, like be, you know presents. Well, there's and a card. Stuff. That's always nice. <laughs> and there's a bag. Yeah, don't lose the card. <laughs> there's the bag is full of tissue paper, and on the bottom there's a little rock in a box. Wow, cool. I put my glasses away. It looks like a pyrite cube. That's, yep. Nice. Well, thank you. Who do You're I welcome. thank? The whole group? Yes, geologists thank you, of whole, Jackson Hole. Thank you, geologist of Jackson Hole. I'm going to get my A little bit further out. back, maybe. Shiny. Shiny. It's on, uh, it's on that focus this thing. This is really oh, hard. I put it up by my face. They're perfect. Look at that. Perfect. <laughs> That's cool, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well done. Now we know That's the trick cool. to showing a, Thank you. showing a mineral on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for coming. Okay, and well, I'm, I'm happy to come up and talk to folks in Jackson. Thanks, everybody on Zoom. <laughs> yes. Yep. And uh, for folks that are here, please, the chairs at this half of the room get piled against this wall and the chairs on the other, as you guys all know, because you're already in motion. Thank you very much. And you guys at home, put your chairs away, too. And everybody can unmute their phones. All right, and I'm going to uh, end the uh, uh, the uh, Zoom uh, uh, Zoom session. Uh, All right. All right. Thank you, Mike. All right. Sure enough. Well, thanks. This helps. That's nice. <laughs>